and welcome to another episode of Around the Verse, our weekly look at Star Citizen's ongoing development. I'm Sandy Gardner. And I'm Jeremiah Lee. Nice to have you here today. Oh, yeah, On great. today's episode, we investigate the new stamina system gameplay and learn how various actions will be affecting your avatar in-game. But before we dive in, let's focus on the most important action happening around the offices, Alpha 3.0. That means it's time to check in with Eric Chiron Davis and the rest of the team for this week's Burndown. Burndown! Burndown! Welcome back to Burndown, our weekly show dedicated to reviewing progress on issues blocking the release of Star Citizen Alpha 3.0. Last week, we ended at 94 total must-fix issues, which was prioritized as 9 blockers, 62 criticals, 21 highs, 2 moderates, and no trivials. So let's check in with the team to see how we're progressing. So main things about 3 at the moment, as uh, we're drilling down more on the, three, uh, the PTU slash either cutting must-fix issues, uh, Tom and I and Paul as well. We've got some more triaging that we're still doing. We're aiming to get through at least the, the criticals before we're definitely signed off on going, yeah, these are our the must-fix issues, uh, but in the meantime, I'm aiming to send out an email to the team about um, the must-fix issues we currently have. Those are the ones we want to start working on uh, in order to push forward for Eva Carti, uh, so focus on those. The thing about game development is that with bug fixing, uh, and particularly drilling down on the must-fix issues that we now have, is that, um, like most things in life, you can have good days and you can have bad days with stuff. Um, developers can have a really good day where uh, they just pull at a thread of a bug, you know, something they've been working on for a little while, and all, all of a sudden they kind of have that eureka moment, they pull on it and then everything else just unravels and it allows them to fix the next few bugs stacked up behind that. On the flip side of things, you can potentially have a really bad day where a feature's got a little bit further, developers have, um, have put some more fixes in, given it to QA over to testing, and QA goes, goes in, starts testing it, and they can go, well, that doesn't work. There's an issue here, there's one there, there's one there. Or you can get a particular issue, again, with a feature or anything, really, in that you can um, come up against one issue and then extrapolate that out, and QA will just go and down the rabbit hole, essentially, and go, right, well, if this doesn't work, well, how about if I do it like this? And what happens if I do this? And what happens there and there and there? And you can end up, from that one just initial find, you can end up with another six or seven bugs we noticed that there are these occasional um, black flashes, as you can see one there, um, in Gran Barta. So like, as, as we were going around, we kind of... Um, we noticed that just as you approach these lights, they get more and more extreme. So what we're seeing here is actually... Um, it's usually the lens flare that's just spreading a problem out, but um, what's usually happened is that something has divided by zero, or it's taken the square root of a negative number, or just something impossible. Um, and so having done one pixel wrong, it then just just smears it all over the screen. So you turn it off and there's just a little bit of it still kind of visible. Um, and going right up to it, I think the, uh, the depth of field starts picking it up as well. But you can just see there are these tiny little, um, tiny little stipple effects. So um, we know that the fog uses this sort of like jittered um, like per pixel jittering, so this kind of matches the pattern. So, like we, uh, I think if you turn off fog, it goes away. So it's probably fog. And what we realised is this is basically when it's doing the rectangular lights. What it has to do is it has to. At one point, it takes the position that it's sampling um, and it finds the nearest point on the light near to it, and then it tries to get the, the direction to that, so it sort of subtracts the two distances and divides by that distance. So if you've actually managed to sample it dead on the middle of, like, somewhere on the plane of the light, it ends up with a zero, it divides by zero, it just screws everything. So actually, we just put in a very small fix. Um, So literally just checking to see if it's zero. If it is zero, we just use a completely different vector that's, it's not exactly the right vector that it should use, but it's its not visibly different. So it, it yeah, ta -da, it works. <laughs> These last few weeks, we've been working on some shopkeepers and the uh, admin office worker is sort of like a, a general purpose location or NPC we have whenever you need uh, to deliver or pick up something from a location that has lots of kind of sub, like a, like a station or a truck stop or something. This will be like a general point where it'll go there before it gets, you know, 
delivered out to where it's supposed to be in the station. And uh, as you can see, we have one of our NPCs here who uh, I just got some new animations from Dave over there, which should hopefully fix this stretching to talk issue, which uh, has been cursing us from being able to test it properly or use it properly. For 3.0, we we're reworking the turrets for all the ships. And not only the ships, but also you might have seen it in the rover as well. So with the turrets, we've added the ability to, uh, you, uh, for the designers to define dead zones and active zones to control how fast the turret turns back and forth. And then recently we've added the feature to have you get into a seat and have the turret rotate while you're while it's getting ready for you to shoot at enemies or other pilots. Turrets are basically like a mini vehicle where they have seats in them and other seat components. And so our exi existing code can't tell the difference between a turret seat and a ship seat. And so it, it just chooses whatever it finds first. So we have to define, no, for this turret, we want you to use the turret seat. Or for the ship, we just want you to use the turret. We got this Yura ticket for a bug that you were randomly dying within visiting our outposts on one of our moons. Uh, it happened in all of them, so we had to open up the editor, uh, as you can see here, and find out what the issue was. And if you look here, you see that we have these blue boxes. I made them a bit higher than the outpost for this example, but this is the atmosphere that, or well, this is the box that contains our room system, which contains uh, atmosphere uh, and actually air so you can breathe within our locations. Uh, but as you can see, there's a gap between two of them uh, or between all of them. Well, it should look like this. Because uh, when they're not touching, that means the air actually just goes nowhere, which makes it like disappear in time. Uh, so you would randomly die at different times because you wouldn't know when the air actually runs out. Um, and that was the bug report we got, so we just found out that, okay, they're not connected, we need to fix this issue. Um, our first solution was actually just to make all the rooms bigger, uh, to make sure they touched each other, um, as you can see in this example here. Um, but we soon realized, like, or well, straight away realized that that also means you can breathe outside. You can technically stand on this window, even though it's outside, you can still breathe and survive without a helmet, which also shouldn't happen because you're on one of the moons that doesn't have um, air you can breathe. So what we had to do was use the custom shape tool that Lumberyard provides um, and actually make these shapes fit so they go out an extra bit where the door comes so the rooms still touch each other but uh, they don't reach outside, so you can actually not stand on the outside also being able to breathe. At the time of filming this, we've reduced our total must-fix issues by 18, which brings us to 76 issues stopping this first release. At the same time, we've checked in a total of 773 new updates to the 3.0 branch. And now this week, we've also made some more important decisions on what we'd like our first round of non-CIG testers to help us evaluate, as well as provide feedback on and keep polishing and fixing. We're really going through this release with a fine-tooth comb, making sure all of the new tech and features work harmoniously together. So while we're all passionately working to knock out the mountain of blockers, as Matt said, uncovering one thread may unravel and reveal a whole myriad of issues that we always hope will knock out more than one big issue at a time. But putting my personal dreams aside, as we're completing and polishing features, those numbers are going to change, and sometimes dramatically, sometimes higher, sometimes lower. So come back next week to see how we're doing here on Burndown. For a more detailed look at what bugs we've been smashing, be sure to check out our 3.0 production schedule report, which we update every week on our website. Now it's time to talk stamina. The dev team has worked hard to build a robust stamina system that takes numerous factors into consideration to provide a more realistic experience. For example, if you sprint into combat, you'll discover that your aim will suffer due to the deep breaths being drawn by the character. Or worse, that you don't have the stamina needed to escape. If the situation goes south, creating a system that requires players to think strategically about their movements was one of the many goals the team had to tackle. To see what else had to be considered when designing the system, let's take a look at this week's feature.
The actor status system started uh, life as a much smaller piece which uh, we're trying to figure out how to breathe in space, how to breathe also how to suffocate in space, how that works. The initial implementation was um, a pretty dodgy thing we did just so we can get to zero out the door. We're putting uh, some kill triggers outside the airlocks just to make sure people don't walk outside in their t-shirts. Obviously, people managed to do that because of our wall collisions not being 100% there and people ended up floating in space in, in their t-shirts. Not, not such a good thing. So eventually we started working heavily on the system, but there were a lot of other things that had to come online before this system could actually be, be fully functional. Uh, the main thing that had to come online was uh, our room system. Our room system defines the space of every room, what the atmospheric composition is in each of these rooms, and how air travels from one room to the other. The other problem we had to deal with was how do, how do doors opening and closing react to this. Our doors initially did not support this feature, so we had to redo all our, all our, all our doors, all our airlocks, elevators, so that when a door opens it actually allows gases to, to travel from one, uh, one uh, room and another. The stamina component defines a default stamina cost, a default uh, stamina regeneration, as well as the requirements to maintain optimal stamina regeneration. On every breath, the stamina component queries the room system for the atmosphere composition and volume of the current room, uh, then replaces a fraction of the oxygen in the room with carbon dioxide and updates the stamina regeneration based on the amount of oxygen replaced. Uh, if there's no oxygen in the current room, there's no regeneration and the player has a limited amount of time before suffocating. The stamina component in, we were able to implement a life support system for the player to survive in space by turning the player's helmet itself into a room. So the player automatically enters this room when equipping the helmet and uh, the stamina system can maintain optimal regeneration because the room queries will always find the helmet. We also added a gas purifier that removes noxious gases from the helmet, uh, including carbon dioxide, and a gas tank that maintains the pressure in the helmet by feeding it oxygen. When it comes to having no helmet on or simply having a helmet that does not have a breathing system, you will be not be connected to your suit, you will breathe whatever is available in the room, and that will have some consequences, especially when you get into places that either have low pressure or not enough oxygen in the atmospheric composition in the room, or simply noxious or poisonous gases in the room. So that will create an interesting gameplay, and we're trying to make sure the player doesn't always keep his helmet on. It it should become fairly costly to keep a helmet on as uh, this brings a lot of interesting gameplay possibilities to Star Citizen where you have to rush to, to uh, a suit locker, get your suit quickly on because your sh ship is getting depressurized and there's no other way. You either get to that suit or you die. Now, the, the main stamina consumer is the player's movement. While the player is moving, their stamina drains depending on stance, equipment weight and movement slope. So walking up the stairs is more expensive than walking down the stairs. So basically every action the player does consumes stamina. If you're sprinting, jumping, crouching, vaulting over obstacles, that will consume stamina. Even idling consumes stamina just on a very low scale compared to the other actions. We want to encourage the player to think tactically when they perform actions. We don't want them to just constantly run, bunny hop everywhere. We're trying to achieve a level of realism here. Basically people who, who will constantly abuse their actions and not think about what they're doing will get punished, while people who are mindful of every little thing they do will get an advantage. Consider yourself sprinting into combat for, I don't know, 30 seconds, and when you get into combat, you're so out of breath that you're just can cannon fodder for everyone else. Your aiming will be really bad, your recall will be unmanageable. You won't even be able to get out of trouble because you, you don't have enough stamina to sprint away from the, from the mess you got yourself into. So this way people who arrive fresh in combat will be way more effective, effective than people who just rush there and yeah, not achieve much. <laughs> Walking instead of sprinting will still consume some stamina, but your regeneration, if nothing's wrong with your character, like, like chest wound or something like this, they will still regen more than you consume where, when, you, when you walk. But you also have the option of completely stopping, and when you completely stop, then you get the maximum regen because your character is not doing anything. 
He's, he's still consuming stamina because he's idling, because we want to start consuming oxygen out, out of your oxygen That's tank. It. Basically, if you just idle in two hours in space, you might run out of oxygen. But if you sprint for 10 minutes, you might run out of oxygen. It's the same because you start consuming way more. The player abilities are the secondary consumers of stamina. Uh, an ability consists of a type, a uh, stamina requirement, a stamina cost, and two checkpoints in the game code saying, okay, this is where this ability starts and this is where it ends. You can only access this part of the code if your stamina is higher than the requirement for it. Um, the cost can also be processed in different ways. There's instant cost, like for jumping or vaulting. There's lasting cost, like for sprinting and holding breath. And there's also conditional cost, which is instant cost that depends on what other abilities are running at the time. And all that was good until well, we added equipment weight into the mix. Uh, jumping with heavy armor and a railgun on your back on Jupiter is a lot more expensive than jumping with a light armor on the moon. Uh, so this meant all abilities suddenly had variable costs. So the designers couldn't uh, reliably adjust uh, the ability cost to ensure the, the player experience. We fix that by taking the, re the remaining stamina into account instead of current stamina. So instead of saying you need 20% stamina to be able to jump, we are saying uh, jumping is not allowed to drain your stamina below 10%. To show the player status, we are using different combinations of post effects. The problem is when several status conditions are using the same post effect, uh, like for example, when bleeding at low health and low stamina, uh, and all these conditions modify the brightness. So we needed um, each effect to be noticeable enough on its own, but also not go crazy when stacking with each other. So we implemented a centralized component that runs with customizable rules. Uh, with a new implementation, we can say, for example, all contrast modifiers after the first one have their strength reduced by 50%, and together they can never exceed a certain value. The buff system has been in the game for a while, but we never really had a reason to use it extensively. Buffs are pieces of data that, con that consist of a type, a value, and sometimes a time limit. Their purpose is to uh, allow virtually anything in the game to modify the player's status using a simple interface. Uh, the actor buff component receives all the buff requests and automatically stacks the buffs of the same type together and broadcasts the new value over the network. Bleeding is implemented as a debuff in game right now. Uh, when a body part takes damage, it applies a stack of bleeding with a value of 1. That means the player will take 1 damage per second from bleeding. Taking damage to another body part applies an additional stack of bleeding, so the player will now bleed for 2 health every second. Healing one of these body parts will remove the corresponding buff. The buff component, together with the stamina, health, breathing, abilities, and GeForce components, make up what we call the actor status system. We use it to change the gameplay experience depending on what happens to the player. So, for example, in the new version 3.0, uh, taking damage to the arm will affect the player's combat abilities, like recoil and weapon sway. Uh, damaging the legs will affect navigation, reduce the movement speed, and increase the stamina cost for jumping and sprinting. Uh, damaging the torso will decrease your uh, stamina pool and regeneration. Uh, running out of stamina or pulling too many Gs will make the player pass out, and so on. One of the important things for us was that the player understands what is happening to them. Just having stamina there is not enough. The player constantly needs to be aware by looking at his screen what condition the character is in. Uh, we had to employ a lot of smaller tricks in getting the player to figure out, oh, I'm running out of breath, I should stop a bit, catch my breath, or oh, my oxygen tank is out. So we had to go add a lot of uh, visual effects on the screen when you're running out of breath. We had to add uh, a lot of uh, audio uh, breathing, we had a lot of animation uh, additives happening to the, to the player. We had to affect the player's aiming, moving up and down with every breath. It's also a lot of UI work that had to go into this uh, to tell the player what's going on at every, every stop, step of the way. On your visor, you get information about what's in your suit. What, what's your condition, how much stamina do you have, what's in your suit, what, what's in your tank, what's in your suit, what, what your stamina is. But if you want information about the outside, then it's the mobile glass right now. That gives you all the information about the room that you are in. My role based on the actor status system was to outline the sound design elements of it, speaking with uh, design and codes and animation, and basically coming up with a sound design system that would be able to 
play breathing sound effects in relation to what the actor, actor state system was doing. I worked closely with Ewan Brown, who's one of our audio programmers, and together we kind of started to build this system, be able to uh, give audio feedback to what the actor state system is doing, so the player kind of hears what the player character is doing. The audio component drives the animation of the character for the, for the breathing. Um, that is going to sync, so the audio will sync with the actual animation of the character breathing and also on the Moby Glass you've got the heart rate monitor uh, and we will be syncing with that as well. Um, so heart rate, breathing rate will all be in sync, it's all driven from the same system. The first step for me was doing a bit of research to find out what breathing styles we're going to need and their relative speeds and characteristics. So I thought the best thing to do was to record myself uh, rather than getting some talent in because I didn't even know if it was going to work. And what I did first of all is set up a tempo map. Uh, I decided to go along and just record myself at different beats per minute, BPM. So we started at 20 beats a minute, and then every couple of bars, I increased the speed by five BPM. So it ranged from 20 BPM up to 190 BPM. So in that actual time, we went from a three second inhale and three second exhale up to a 0.3 of a second inhale and 0.3 of a second exhale, which is really, really fast. So I, yeah, a lot of fun recording that. The, the benefit of recording to the tempo map is you got a lot of variation and you got a lot of assets that very, very quick. However, the downside was I didn't realize how breathing rapidly without needing to, how much I could mess you up. I, d I did nearly pass out a couple of times at the upper end of uh, the BPM scale. Fortunately, it didn't. Once I got enough material, what I did is I ed edited it all together. So I split all the inhales and all the exhales for the specific BPM and then bounced them all out of Reaper. So I had individual inhale assets and exhale assets. The actor status system uh, sonically consists of three main elements. So you've got the breathing styles, uh, which are the different types of breathing. Uh, then we've got the grunts and vocalizations. And then we've also got the SFX support. So that's like sound effects relating to your suit, uh, sort of like alarms and like UI elements and stuff like that. Currently we have 13 breathing styles that will most likely increase. That's currently split across uh, two suites. So we've got a breathing suite for FPS, so we're just running around. We also have a breathing suite for piloting because in those two different situations, you will be using different styles of breathing. So in FPS, you'll be having normal breathing, recovery breathing, when you're fatigued, taking uh, damage and injury. But then when you're piloting, we use specific breathing styles for that situation. Uh, one of them is called AGSM, which is uh, anti-G-force straining maneuver, also known as the HIC uh, technique. And it's a technique pilots use to stop passing out over high Gs. It kind of like they force, like force their blood pressure to, to remain high in like their head and stuff like that. So when you're pulling really high Gs, you see people start hearing going, hey! <laughs> uh, what's loads of reference material and the, the, the kind of the, the stresses and strains these pilots put themselves through is insane. So the game actually calls discrete inhale and exhale triggers, which is great. The level of fidelity that we've got is brilliant. So the actor status system and the audio component in tandem pass particular values in relation to stamina, O2, health, even like composition of the oxygen and the atmosphere in the room. That feeds into our audio component, which I have control through via Dataforge. There's a Dataforge record that I can control the breathing suites, the breathing styles, and all the conditional transitions. And through that, I can dictate which breathing style is played at a certain time and how that breathing style correlates to the values that are being passed from the actor status system. So the actual audio exists in WISE, which is our audio middleware tool. With the, these what, th currently 13 different styles of breathing, they all live in their own discrete actor mixer hierarchy. Uh, within that actor mixer, there's a blend container which contains um, inhales, and there's a blend container that uh, includes exhales, so they'd be, they'd be triggered uh, independently, one after the other. And uh, within that, they each have uh, a range of random containers ranging from the 20 BPM all the way up to 190 BPM. And then the blend containers actually respond to an RTPC, which is a real-time parameter control, which uh, takes the values from the actor state system and the audio component, and that selects which of the BPM breaths it should play. Uh, then the game calls the, the play trigger, um, which is like play, breath, inhale, or Pray, uh, play, breath, recovery, exhale. It triggers it from wise, and that's what you hear in the game.
The, the animation for the breathing is driven off the Data Forge record, and you control the you can control the curves of the breathing, um, which can influence the uh, curves of the animation. Now for audio, it, it represented a unique challenge for us because normally we're at the end of the stream, but downstream process normally everything gets done. We put audio to it. Uh, this is the first time that I've uh, ever worked on a system where audio drives another feature. So audio is actually driving animation, so we have to make sure we sync with animation very closely because normally our footprint is post. It's never normally, it directly impacts the input of another department. You have to, you have to sync, right? You can't have a breathing and breathing going in and out and the, the animation going out and in. I was involved with the breathing animations, uh, the procedural breathing animations. Um, so making the player's arms and chest move up and down as he breathes. Um, and mostly focusing on getting in sync with the audio um, and getting the feedback there for the player once they're tired or exhausted. So the system itself is fairly complex on the back end. There's a lot of sort of variables involved and lots of different sort of states and levels to it. But from the player's point of view, we try and keep it as simple and easy to read as possible because obviously it's, it's all about player feedback. It's all about them being able to see, oh, I'm tired, oh, I'm exhausted, I need to slow down a bit, I need to stop exerting myself and sort of communicating that to them sort of simply and easily while also having the complexity of the back end system and having these sort of more advanced systems behind it. It doesn't slow you down, but it will tell you that you're more tired. Um, you won't be, if you're running along, you won't run slower, but you'll run heavier. Um, the audio will get more intense, you'll breathe heavier, your arms will move more. Um, it'll have more of an effect of when you're trying to aim at someone. If you're exhausted, your aim's gonna be all over the place. Um, obviously, this is quite a, it's fairly subtle at the sort of normal stamina levels. Um, you won't really notice it. That's the whole point of the breathing system. If you're doing things normally, you don't notice your breathing. Um, it's only when you're properly exhausted when you've really been exerting yourself, um, you will know about it. You'll know you're panting, your arms are moving about, your chest is heaving, and you will be exhausted. From the breathing animation point of view, the primary feedback for the breathing is the audio. That's the thing, normally in games, that you hear yourself breathing, that's how you know you're tired. The main thing was getting the animations to match up with this audio. We can't use just a baked animation because the breath lengths are different. You breathe deeper or shallower. Uh, you take long breaths, you take deep breaths, you take short breaths. So we couldn't, we thought about maybe having animations captured and then blending between them and lengthen them or shorten them, but and then we had to go procedural. And the way we did it was we've got curved data that comes directly from Maya, directly from the animators tool. We pulled that into DataForge via script that was written by Rob Howes down in Derby. And then that data is then read by the game and it can be played back. We can adjust the speed of it at runtime. So basically as the audio tells us, this is going to be the length of your next breath. We go that's how long the animation has to last. Um, it also ties into the aim pose system. Um, so in Lumberyard, you've got an aim pose over the top of the player, which determines where he's aiming. Um, so that plays on the, it's about the last layer it plays on the animation. And it points the gun where he's looking, um, it adjusts him if he's looking straight up, it points the gun straight up. If he's looking down, he looks straight down. Um, and obviously it's adjusted for different weapons. Um, you get different pivot points and such. Using the procedural animation, we can put it over the top of the impose. Um, so if you're looking up, you'll breathe correctly over the right direction. And it all um, works smoothly and it works non-obtrusively. As we started only with a, a breathing system, we were we thought our job is mostly done, but eventually we were asked whether we can add the G-Force system to go through the same process because it's basically just forces acting on the player and causing various good or bad conditions on the player. So the current GeForce simulation, the, the one in the live version right now, is very accurate, it's very realistic. It goes as far as simulating how the human body naturally adapts under the effect of G-forces. However, moving forward, we need a more generic simulation that works with any type of entity in any context, not only human players piloting a ship. And we need it simple enough to be able to run on all entities at all times. For example, we need unsecured cargo to fall over when the ship accelerates. Our new solution monitors the accumulated velocity of the entity and all the physics grids they are inside of. So we take the linear and angular velocity of the entity, transform them into the parent space, and add the parent's velocities and transform them into the parent space and so on until there's no parent. Then we can track any change in the accumulated velocity. Any change in velocity means acceleration and acceleration means g-force. This kind of became the birth of the actor status system, which is a larger unifying system, kind of brings together 
every little thing that can happen to the actor, to the player or to other characters. So we wanted that all the effects that appear on the screen, all, all the things that happen to him go through the same filter as we don't want them to conflict with each other. If we would have made separate system for, for every little thing that can happen to the player, let's say he's hungry or he's thirsty or he's affected by G-forces or he's out of breath, each of those would have conflicted with, with the other and that would have been a nightmare for all of us. So that's why we had to unify and this became the actor status system. It seemed to take off and every single idea from how the player reacts to G-force and uh, exhaustion and being able to do abilities like jumping and jumping over ledges are all affected by this. So we've got how the grunts and the other sounds in his dialogue all need to interact with the breathing. So it's become rather complicated. So um, I've set up a system in the code to, to link quite a few different systems. The, the lungs of the players are how he animates and how that affects the, the wobble of the gun need to be driven by the breathing and that needs to be in sync with the, the audio that we've provided. The challenges we had were, you know, we'd start off with something simple and it would work fine for, for one scenario. So we'd basically just try uh, sprinting and, and when you stop sprinting, it quickly became apparent that it didn't sound very realistic. So we just quickly start breathing at a normal speed and and we would expect him to sound exhausted for a lot longer. So to, to fine tune all of that to how long it takes to recover and how he sounds when he's when he's recovering led on to new styles of breathing. So that one was the recovery style of breathing. So when you sound exhausted, you take deeper, longer breaths until you've recovered. I set up a system using our usual user interface for the, the dev team, DataForge. And we started off with just, basically it looks like a table of numbers and parameters for the different ranges of breathing speeds and lung volumes that would need to be taken in to give the player the amount of oxygen back into the system to make him recover his stamina, which is you know the ultimate goal of the breathing. Given the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere or the room, we, we calculate um, how much stamina he can regenerate. So for each breathing style, we, we tend to have a busier curve to make it possible to fine-tune the amount of stamina that he's got or needs translates into how fast he needs to breathe or how deep he needs to breathe. Quickly from there, we realized we had so many different styles of breathing, like when you're injured or recovering from exhaustion or piloting a ship and experiencing high g-force the transitions between these became so complicated to manage we couldn't just do a straight interpolation in between each one i set up a, a new thing which we, we termed a breathing suite so that was a flow graph set up to join them all together with with different transition nodes and the transition node itself would have a flexible number of conditions that would make it follow the different parts of the flow graph to a different style. So we've expanded that with so many parameters like checking the health or the stamina or the g-force or whether you're blacking out and we can get it to react in, in so many ways that make it sound realistic that I think we've got more than 14 different styles and it, it really gives the player a feeling that, that something realistic is happening. So the active status system in general attracts a whole lot of variables, things like exertion, you have stamina of course, and that all ties into the room system which has oxygen, but you know a room may not have just oxygen, it has other things you know, might not have a full pressurized atmosphere. So it's important for the UI to sort of communicate state of your surroundings are, you know, so uh, what kind of oxygen is present in your current atmosphere, basically. So if you go into an airlock and, you know, you depressurize, then your oxygen tank uh, won't refill anymore. Or if you're on a planet with low oxygen or there's a low atmospheric pressure, then you know that your oxygen tank probably wouldn't refill as quickly as it would in a regular atmosphere. One of the big things that we that we track in the UI is it's basically an ECG graph, which is an indication of your stamina. So if you run up a flight of stairs or you know you, you sprint for a long time, then you obviously see your heart rate going up, your ECG graph getting a bit more intense. So then that kind of lets you know that you're exerting a lot of energy and you're maybe take a rest if it's getting too high. So it's very, it's, it's, it's cool because it's not like a exact value that you're seeing. It's a bit more indirect, which is kind of cool. And then, you know, it's, it's a nice visual in terms of the UI as well this display on your mobile glass and we're also going to be displaying it on on the visor as well so i mean obviously in kind of a very important piece of information that you pretty much want to have most of the time and be available to you at all times so we have it in the hud but there's additional information on the mobile glass that we have obviously another good thing to know about the actor status is what is the state of your surroundings so 
in your immediate uh, atmosphere um, because you know you can go in and out of rooms. Different planets might have different atmospheres, different atmospheric pressures, different atmospheric compositions, and that all affects how quickly your gas tank would refill. Let's say if you're running low on oxygen or something, you want to refill it or whether or not it's safe to take off your helmet or not. You can pull up your Moby glass to uh, see, kind of like in that movie, The Martian, where it's checking his status. For planning ahead, uh, this will be only dependent on the tools the players have. We want to give them the most basic tool, which is the Moby glass, to just check what is available in their room right now, but they might have access to some better equipment which gives them, they can scan two, three rooms ahead or look at the door and go, what's on the other side? That will help them choose whether they open a door, whether they don't. Also on the doors, the, the refactoring of the doors, we have indicators now that what the conditions are on the other side. You will always get the warning, there will be a red light if something's wrong on the other side. You will not be able to, uh, you will be able to, but it's your, cons it's your problem if you just want to open a door to outer space. It's, but the, the, the game kind of gives you the information. It's up to you to whether you use it or not, and you will suffer the consequences if you don't. Work on the actor status system will not stop here. This will be a long, ongoing process of adding multiple things to the conditions that can affect the player. We're talking here from small little things of basically getting poisoned from whatever's in the room to getting drunk, needing to go to the toilet, all of the little things that can affect the player temporarily. And then we can expand this to go even to stuff like long-term diseases and all kind of depressurization sickness, radiation sickness and all these things that won't be something that the player can get rid of instantly. They will have to go find a medical specialist in the game that can treat those things and that treatment might take a while. We'll have to see how we implement that, but the possibilities are pretty pretty large here. The an ultimate goal for the actor status system is to have the to have it support multiple multiple races as they get introduced into Star Citizen and uh, will, players will have to be aware that certain races breathe a different atmospheric composition. When they enter their ships and their territory, they need to be aware they cannot just remove their helmets. And if they have to deal with these races, as in transport them across the universe, they have to cater for those races' needs. They can't just shove them in a place full of oxygen. They might not like that. They might simply suffocate or they might have adverse conditions to certain chemical elements that humans just love. It needs to feel real. It needs to, you need to be aware of every little thing that's happening in, in, the, in the world. You need to be aware of this room might be completely depressurized. That's depressurized. That's why we give the player tools. They have the Moby Glass app that they can use to check, oh, this, has 0.1 poisonous gas, this does not have enough pressure, this oxygen is too much here, rather than just too little, and you might have uh, a hyperoxia problem if you breathe that for a lot of time. So it's, it's just, players need to be aware, we give them the tools to be aware of the environment, but they need to check and make the tactical decisions and the good choices with the, that allows them to survive or not. As you saw, stamina is but one component in the actor status system. Combining stamina with these other factors, like health and g-forces, makes your avatar feel more like a real person, not just a game character. Yeah, this new system also creates a lot of interesting new gameplay scenarios. Players must consider how the armor they're wearing or a room's atmosphere condition might affect their stamina. Decisions like that will help make the game feel more immersive. Well, that's all for today's episode. Thanks to our subscribers, it's because of you that we can produce all our shows and provide constant updates for the community. September subscriber Flare will be released on Friday, so be sure to keep an eye out for it. Very cool. And finally, a big thanks to all of our backers for their support. Until next week, we'll, we'll see, see you, you around, around the verse. Yes, I nailed it. Yes. yes.
you for watching. So if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest in Star Citizen and Squadron 42's development, please follow us on our social media channels. See you soon.